Guys, you know what? This week I was looking at my, uh, my clothing and I have my Quicksilver slops are, they look at me and they're like, again, John, every day we go out, we are exhausted. Please, could you give some of the other items of clothing that don't get an outing as much an outing? And so I thought I'd give my jacket a spin today. Just, there you go. Yay. Yay. Okay, guys, I've got two hours worth of a sermon to preach in 25 minutes. Okay, so please open your Bible. Jeremiah 29. If you're visiting with us, we're really towards the end of the book of Deuteronomy, which is, um, it's been an amazing series so far. I just learned, I've learned so much going through this series. And today is kind of, Steph and I are finishing off the series together. Steph's next week, I'm this week. And today is kind of the culmination, and next week is the culmination of everything. And today is the day where Moses is now like, he's taught the law, he's given them everything, and now there is the charge. This is, the, he's charging them just before they go over. It's like, you know that moment, it, like all the horses are in the um, metal thing that opens when the horses run out? It's not a paddock, that's where they sleep, it's the run paddock, that's... Uh, all the horses in there, and, the, and the, the gun's about to go, and they're about to launch into the promised land. And I think this is so important for us, friends, because all of us are facing a future. All of us have something in front of us. All of us have a tomorrow. All of us have a this afternoon. All of us have a lunchtime today. And Moses here charges them so much with regards to the future, and he speaks to them about how to live out, uh, live out your life. And, and the temptation is to preach one of these health, wealth, and prosperity messages of like, well, you know, all the, the good stuff that's gone ahead of you. But we're going to look honestly at how does God look at the future and how do we walk in what would bring God joy into the future? So just want to kind of lay a bit of a platform. When I was younger, which was many years ago, if this jacket says anything, right? <laughs> When I was younger, I don't know if you remember the way that the, the news or, or the TV or whatever used to talk about communism, right? It was like everything was gray and it like everyone was in food lines. I mean, I'm sure that it was that bad, but I just remember I had friends who came out of East Germany who were in there. I remember when the wall came down, that's how old I am. You know, in East Germany, they had these cars that you would wait for like four years for. It was called a trabi. The car was basically made of masonite. It was the only car that they made, and you would wait in a queue, and, well, not in a physical queue, like voting, but like in a queue, and eventually you would pay, and then you would get this car. And when the wall came down, I remember the videos of all these little trubbies driving through, like, uh, through the, um, the border and coming through to West Germany, and the guys were all partying together. Germany was united. But I remember, like, thinking that German, I mean, communism was so backward. And it's so easy to think that our society that we live in is so forward and so progressive because there, is, there does seem to be a pressure today on many fronts that the house you live in today is smaller than the house you're going to live in. The car you're driving today is smaller than the car you're going to drive, right? The position you are in your workplace is less than the position you're going to be in. There's always this progress, move forward, go higher, more, bigger, influence, all these kind of things that come to us. And today I want to talk to us, and, and it's going to be a hard sermon in that I'm not talking to us as individuals. We just had our national elections, and that's not really got anything to do with it, but it's just beautiful how it lines up. I want to talk to us as a people, as a grouping, as the church, because it's too often that we reduce ourselves to, it's me. Every scripture God wrote to me. Every promise is written to me. And I forget that God, when he looks at us, sees us as his bride, his church. There is an usness about what God says to us. It's not all about ourselves. If you look in Jeremiah 29, 11, right? The scripture that plagues the back of toilet doors and um, fridges across the world. 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. And the thing is, this, what's so, what's so beautiful in some senses, some people have taken these plans for my life that I'm going to take hold of these things. And, and what has been beautiful to see over history is people have 
there's been advances in science. God has got a plan for my life. It's not the same as God's plan for Tim's life. So I can't look at Tim and copy him. What is God saying to me? What should I be doing? And so there are advances in science and medicine and all these kind of things. And society does move forward, which is wonderful. But the tragedy of this, this scripture is that so often that's all it's seen as. Let me give you some context to that scripture. I'll read from before it then after it. From verse 10, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. This is written to Israel in exile. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come to me and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. The you here is plural. It's not singular. And friends, sometimes it's so easy for us to get reduced to the singular. What is God saying to me? What does God want to do with me? What does God want to um, accomplish in me? What does my life look like today? And friends, much of what Scripture says is God speaking to His church about her future into the future. Not just about ourselves. This desire that we have inside ourselves, we, we are so easily seduced that it's about me growing at whatever cost. My growth, my health, wealth, and happiness. My desire to grow, sounds good, to be recognized more, to be worshipped for what I know. Now, we wouldn't say that outright, but it is nice when I'm the cleverest guy in the room, right, and everyone's asking me. To earn more so I can feel safe. Right? To be the loudest voice in the room, to have a better life so I can be comfortable, to have more possessions so I can feed my vices. These things have become the societal norm. And we use scriptures like, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, to prosper you and not to harm you. And somehow that becomes a fuel for this kind of lifestyle. And so while we can criticize communism, all that stuff, I'm just saying in our Western world, it's not a whole lot better. Right? It's like the needles just swung to the other side. And the tragedy of this, when I look around in the world, has led to poverty, mass inequality. It's fueled racism and genocide as the lines have been drawn where the plans are for me and not for you. For us and not for them. It's gone very quiet. Big words. Racism and genocide, right? I'm, but we need to talk about this stuff, guys. Because God was talking here to a nation. A people group, not just to the individual. When we, when I think that God is hell bent on my success and my success only, I forget that if it's just about my success, someone else is going to lose. God is concerned with us. It's the same thing that Adam and Eve brought into the Garden of Eden. We can have this progress, this growth, this go forward without a need for God. The enemy dangled the carrot of, you can be better, you can be more, you can be like God. You can, you don't need him. So this is kind of the context, right? It's, it's a peach sermon, hey? This is encouraging, hey? Everyone's so excited. And you know what, guys? As I've looked back over history, I've seen when, he, and it, it's, I'm not trying to simplify history, but where man has honored God, you see blessing, life, growth, hope. When man has turned from God and done his own thing, it looks like there's been progress. But look, the nations have been torn apart. People have been separated. There's been lines drawn on, on social lines, race lines, cultural lines. There's just, when man is the one who is plotting the future, it's a mess. It doesn't matter how clever we are. And this shouldn't surprise or amaze us. Because, friends, the creator understands the creation. The author knows the story and the builder knows the building, not the other way around. And this is the whole context of what Moses is saying to the people just before they go in. This is what, what I've just told you. This is what he's reminding them of. Moses is talking about this. He says that the builder has a plan. The author has a story. And the creator has a, has a model. Because they're about to enter into a land with endless possibility. These are slaves. Sam spoke about it so well the other day. Like, these people had never experienced. Guys, if you didn't hear Sam's sermon, it was last week, eh, Sam? 
like, I'm not sure if it's uploaded, but when it's uploaded, go listen to that thing. God has a plan for the future. But when these guys were slaves, they didn't know what a future looked like. Their, their joy was not that. It was a negative joy. It was a no longer that. And the future just looked open in front of them. And that made them incredibly vulnerable to anything that could seduce them in the desires of their own hearts. And so the author comes and says, don't worry, you're safe. There is a plan. There is a story. There is a model that I have for you. Moses is reminding them that they have a choice as to how they're going to build, what they will choose as the gold standard going forward, and then the implications of that choice. And the same is the true for us as the church, friends. This is where it really starts to come home. What, who defines what success is into the future? What defines what love looks like into the future? What defines what is true and what is false? Because it can't be compassion. Compassion without truth, for me, is one of the most unstable foundations for action. I felt, do you know how much horrific stuff has been done in the world because somebody felt? Comfort in many cases is the primary opposition to maturity. To pander to someone's comforts, to recognize or to validate them can insulate the individual from the pain and discomfort that is necessary for maturity. So what is the gold standard by which we go forward, friends? Moving forward down the wrong path is not progress or growth. In fact, it's the opposite. Sometimes growth entails stopping and turning around and returning to where we should be, to go backward, to go forward. And this is what Moses is putting in front of God's people. He's saying to them in these, these chapters that I'm preaching today, 27 to 31, you do it your way, it will be a disaster. You don't understand, you didn't make this, you didn't write the story or build this future. You're not that good. You do it God's way, you will find blessing, provision, and a future you could only have dreamt of. However, it requires submission to his word and a conviction that what he has said is true and good. And friends, this is what we face. Every day I wake up, there is a story that has been written. I was saying to my girls in the car today, and it's kind of a bit of a pre, um, I'll jump, I'll get to this point, but I want to mention it now. Jesus is the only one who can say to us, remember the future. Because he's been there. We can only remember our past. It's a big thought that, if you think about it. The first part of chapter 27, he speaks of the importance of remembering what God has done. The second part of 27, all of 28, he speaks of what God is going to do. And then in 29, he calls all Israel to consider how they will respond to this. So let's jump in our Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 27, if we can. Sorry if I'm speaking, am I speaking really fast here, Sam? How am I doing? It's okay. I'm not reading, okay. <laughs> okay, Deuteronomy 27 from verse 1. Moses and the elders of Israel commanded the people... Keep all these commands that I've given you today. So guys, bear in mind the context of what I've laid here. Because it's so easy, if you don't understand that, to misunderstand what's being said. Keep all these commands that I give you today. When you have crossed the Jordan into the land the Lord your God is giving you, set up some large stones and coat them with plaster. Write on them all the words of this law when you have crossed over to enter the land the Lord is giving you. A land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your ancestors, promised you. And when you've crossed the Jordan, set up these stones on Mount Ebal, as I commanded you today, and coat them with plaster. Build there an altar to the Lord your God, an altar of stones. Do not use any iron tool on them. Build the altar of the Lord your God with field stones, and offer burnt offerings on it to the Lord your God. Sacrifice fellowship offerings there, eating them and rejoicing in the presence of the Lord your God. And you shall write very clearly all the words of this law on these stones you have set up. And so there's three things I want to talk about today. I want to talk about remember what God has done. I want to remember what God is going to do. And then how do we respond to it? One, two, three, and then we're done. So the first one, remember what God has done. When we look back through scripture, God's intention for us is always that we would be God's people, that he would have a place for us, right? And we would experience his presence. Now, PPP, I know, I don't like alliteration, but just remember, people place presence. That was always God's intention for us. 
that he, we would be his people. He, he promised us, I've gone ahead of you to prepare a place for you in heaven. But even so, he says, wherever you are on the earth, my presence will be with you. God's plan is never to send and off we go and then he sits at a distance. That we go from being his people to not his people to, and that the relationship, because in our human relationships, we have proximity, not proximity, proximity, not proximity. Take the rubbish out, proximity. Don't take the rubbish out, no proximity. You know what I'm saying? Like that's how we live our lives. And when God looks at us, like he's like, I always have proximity to you. Presence. You are my people. And I'm preparing a place for you. And Moses is reminding the people. So I'm talking now about remembering what the Lord has done. The first point. Moses is reminding them that to go forward to establish, they should remember God's intention. To look back, to build forward. Friends, our future is not, he's reminding them this, that anything goes. With regard, the, the, friends, the future is not anything goes. We are God's people. We are called to heaven one day, but for now, our place is Johannesburg. And can I be the first person to say, Johannesburg is blessed that you are here. Blessed that you are here. And His presence is with us. Remember these things, to move forward. Remember these things, Moses is saying. And so there's three things he mentions here quickly. He mentions field stones. Gathered from the field, just like Jesus gathered us. Right? Jesus came into the field and gathered us. Came to faith. That stone didn't do anything to qualify to be on the altar. It just lay there, half in the mud. If you feel like you've been there before, right? All good. Field stone. No iron tool was allowed to be worked on it. Not shaped by a human being. Not trying to be like another stone. Not trying to shape itself. Not trying to fit in. As God made it, it was ready to be knitted into the altar. And thirdly, it was meant to be covered in plaster. And the beauty of that is that it wasn't the stone's responsibility to ensure that it stayed knitted in. It was the plaster's responsibility to ensure that the stone was knitted in. God's given us this Holy Spirit, friends, that's been shed abroad in our hearts and that's knitted us into his church. And he's the one who holds us in. But we can do plenty to try and break out. And to think of ourselves as independent or think of ourselves as not part. But there is this altar of remembrance that we can go to and go, he picked me. He found me in the field in the mud. And he didn't come to me and go, once you've put the, an iron tool on it and shaped it enough, then you will qualify. You are qualified and I pick you up as you are. And then... He puts us in and he puts plaster on to keep us in friends. He said, remember this. Because if you don't remember this, when you go into the promised land, you're going to forget all these good things of what God has done for you. And friends, when we walk into our tomorrow, I am God's person. He found me. He knitted me into his church. He didn't look. Everybody else who looks at you goes, your hair is too long. You're too fat. You're too thin. You're not gifted enough. You're not clever enough. You don't have enough money. You don't blah, 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 blah. Put an iron tool to this thing and fix it. And God goes, I love you as you are. Amen. So we remember these things. And these are the things that gives us the go forward into our future. No two field stones are alike. Weathered and shaped by circumstance. Chosen by the maker. Plastered and impermanent. But then he says, you shall write very clearly all the words of this law on these stones that you have set up. And here's a big one, friends. It's grace. It's the grace of God that has knitted us into the church. But that doesn't guarantee our inheritance. It is our submission and obedience to his word that ensures our inheritance. It's not just good enough to be knitted in and picked and chosen. There are also the words of God that are written clearly on the altar. What has God said to us, friends? What has he written to us? Are we making it up as we go along? We love the grace. I love that I'm knitted in. I think back, oh, he saved me. I remember the day I got saved. I came dancing down the aisle, and it was beautiful. And Jesus took my hand, and it was so special. Great. But what about the go forward now? What about inheriting? Remember, there is an author who has a story who knows what he's building. It's written on the altar. Titus talks about this. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. 
Hallelujah. I love that. It's so awesome, right? But it goes on. Bringing salvation for all people, then in verse 12, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live upright, self-controlled, godly lives in this present evil age. It doesn't say that God is going to renounce, but grace gives us the ability to renounce ungodliness. Because this is for inheritance now, friends. Remember what God has said. I've come to see in my life that if I don't remember these things, this altar, I go off the rails and I do end up embracing ungodliness. I go off the rails and I begin. So that's on the, on the bad side, but on the other side, as I get into legalism and I begin to try in my own strength because I forgot, right, that I've been knitted in with plaster, that he's the one who holds me there. But on the other side, if I forget that, that he's written his, his law, his words on my heart, then I'm just stoked to be all that he's done for me and I just, there's no truth in me. This is why we pray. This is why we come together on Sundays. This is why we come to home groups. Not to earn but to remind ourselves of God's goodness. The altar wasn't just to remind them of the past. It was to remind them of their future. And God hasn't just given us his word to remind us of what he's done, but just as much to remind us of what he's going to do. And that's the segue into the second point. All right, how are we doing? Are we okay? Um, lots of stuff just coming at you, right? So are we handling? Is it going to be okay? Good. Okay, Deuteronomy 27 Reading from verse 9. Remember what Jesus is going to do. So we've spoken about what he has done. The altar. Let's talk about what he's going to do. Then Moses and the Levitical priest said to Israel, Keep silence and hear, O Israel. This day you have become the people of the Lord your God. You shall therefore obey the voice of the Lord your God, keeping his commandments and his statutes, which I command you today. That day Moses charged the people, saying, when you have crossed over Jordan, these shall stand on Mount Gerizim to bless the people, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Joseph, and Benjamin. And these shall stand on Mount Ebal for the curse, Reuben, Gad, Asher, Zebulun, Dan, and Naphtali. And the Levites shall declare to all the men of Israel in a loud voice, Cursed be the man who makes a carved or cast metal image, an abomination to the Lord, a thing made by the hands of a craftsman and sets it up in secret. And all the people shall answer and say, Amen. The curse be anyone who dishonors his father or mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. And then jump to the end. Cursed be anyone, in verse 26, be anyone who does not confirm the words of this law by doing them, and all the people shall say, Amen. Amen. So what, what he's saying here is the tribes get split in half. Half of them on, on Gerizim, half of them on Ebal. And it's not like the Drakensberg there, right? It's like little hills. And there's a little valley in between. So they can hear each other. And half of them are going to proclaim the curses. And half of them are going to proclaim the blessings. And they're all going to say? Amen. Because what they are doing is they are agreeing, God, what you say about the future is true. And it is good. And if we do our thing, it's like Moses was a preschool teacher. Everyone's nodding, going, you know, we understand. And then you ask the kid the question, and they got no idea. <laughs> what is one plus one? Purple. Okay, let's go back. So he makes them recite. If you do what God says, what are the blessings? And they recite the blessings to everyone. And then he goes to the other side. And if we don't do what God has said, what will happen? These things are what, does everybody understand? And all the people said, amen. So it's like really helping the people understand Guys, there is so much riding on this moment. We are about to go into the promised land. And there's so much riding on our lives, friends, about our future. And I don't know how you approach Scripture. Do you look at the blessings of God and go, amen, for me, amen. But when I look at the curses and I look at what it looks like when I depart from God's ways, I look at those and I go, amen. Do I agree that I'm a Muppet? Do I agree that I don't have it all together? Do I agree that I don't see the whole thing? Or do I sneaky, sneakily think I've got, I've got most of it down? Just need God, the finishing touches. Twelve times they say amen to the covenants of God in this text. Once for each tribe of Israel. 
Amen, God, we understand. Amen, God, we agree. Amen, God, we submit. And so in chapter 28, we see them recite the blessings from 1 to 14. And then from 15 to 68, they recite the curses. And when I was reading that, I was like, geez, that's harsh. Like 15 verses of blessing and then like 54 verses of curse. Why? You know why, friends? Because Jesus isn't Oprah Winfrey. And that's not all. You get one. You get one. He's not like a cheap salesman who's like trying to, his blessings are so good. I've come that you might have life and life to the full. What more do we need than that? Why so many curses? <laughs> because when you, I've come to see this as human beings. I, I want to read the text, even though we're a bit short on time. In Romans chapter 1, Paul writes, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what, they, what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malicious, maliciousness. They are gossipers, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolishness, foolish, faithful, faithless, heartless, and ruthless. It's because the heart of mankind is so good at inventing evil. We are so creative, right? We are like Picasso sinners. If you like Picasso with the eyes. Eh? Like, there are so many curses because man is so sinful. And God's blessings are just so absolute and so complete and so beautiful. Jesus promises us that his yoke is easy and his burden is light. He took issue with the Pharisees adding so many things to God's word that people ended up bound and insecure. He wanted it simple. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. There's so many curses because we're so creative and are evil. And friends, what this text reminds us of, and this should scare some of us, it's a pretty hardcore thing. God is so faithful to bless, but God is just as faithful to curse. Just as faithful to curse. Do you know why? Because if each person lived out their life the way they wanted to live the life, what would happen to Sin makes so much sense for me, but as soon as you take it into us, and God is just, and he is good, and he is loving, and he loves the person next to you as much as he loves you, you are not the main person in the story. He loves you very much, more than anyone, yet it's us. And so... And, and what's so sad is when you get into the second part of this chapter of 28, when it starts talking about the curses, it says stuff like this. In chapter 54, the man who is the most tender and refined among you will begrudge food to his brother, to the wife he embraces, and to the last of his children whom he has left, so that he will not give away any of them, any of the flesh of his children whom he is eating, because he has done nothing else, because he has nothing else left in the siege and in the distress with which your enemy shall distress you in all of your towns. No filters, no hiding. I love what Moses is saying because he's saying, that's what sin looks like. That's what sin does. I know it gets a candy coating. It gets a, it gets a pass in the world. We change what sin is so we can justify stuff. This is what it gives birth to. And friends, when I look around the world today and I watch the way that guys are mutilating children, I look at the way some of this stuff has changed. I'm like, we are not far away from some of this stuff. Hardcore, eh? But we've got to stand for what is true. Like, we, we shouldn't look at it and go, oh my word, how can this be happening? He promised us God is faithful to curse. Not that he causes it, but he says, do you understand that if people do not build according to, I am the author, I am the perfecter, I am, I'm the one who's got the picture, I'm the builder. And when people don't build this way, this is a good gemors. Remember what God is going to do. Remember his promises. Remember what Jesus has intended for his church. If we make up our own thing, if we invent our own methods and turn our back on him, friends, the church will become irrelevant, powerless, and only fit to be thrown to the side. And that's what Jesus is talking about when he talks about salt. When salt loses its saltiness, it should be just thrown to the ground for people to trample on. And friends, when we begin to build according to our pattern and our way, 
ahead of the future, like the Israelites going to the promised land, when I'm building according to my pattern, we lose our saltiness. And we do become irrelevant and, and the laughing stock. So we finish with this. How do we respond to this? I've got through this whole sermon. I'm out of breath, but we did it. Yes! Guys, this thing has challenged the living daylights out of me. When I look at my future, I'm just like, it matters. Like, I know that, I know that. But I don't know that grace has got time for me to play Minecraft and, and find a, whatever. But like, our future matters. So how do we respond? In Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, it says, The secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Friends, there's so much that we don't know. And the future isn't clear. Understanding why and how things happen are not always clear to us. There are so many questions. And this book says to us, if we needed to know, God would tell us. The secret things belong to him. Stop worrying about the things you don't know. He has spoken to us about so much. Do those things. Because that's what belongs to us. He's given them to us. It's his gift to us. 66 books in the Bible. The presence of the Holy Spirit with us. Him walking with us. He's promised us these things. That's where we put our time and our, and our, our attention. The things that have been revealed belong to us. They are precious and they are ours. Given by the author and the perfecter of our faith. So I began at the beginning talking about progress, growing, developing, winning, all this kind of stuff that we have in our hearts. Peter writes in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. I want you to hear this, guys. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's who we are. Yes, it is who you are, but it's also who we are. God's intention is that we as the church are salt and light to a dying world. Our growth and progress in moving forward is not only good for those who are part of the church, but it is also a sign to those who are drowning and who have lost hope. So we remain as these people by remembering what Jesus has done, not only for me, but for us we remain as the people by being convinced of what he's going to do, not only for me, but for us. And we value his word and his instruction as the only way to build and the only way to live, not only for me, but for us. Can I pray for us? I feel like I've run comrades. Father, so many words. We said so many words today. Pray that you would take your word and seal it in our hearts. Lord, when we look at the future, our eyes are open and our hearts are open to know that it matters. That it's not anything goes. Lord, you have a plan and you have a purpose. You have given us your word. Lord, we dare not and we don't want to wobble into our future in our own understanding. Making up our own ideas about finance and relationships and and, and rest and family and all the other things and success. And Lord, we want to come to your word and build according to the pattern that you gave us. Thank you so much, Jesus, that you found these field stones and you picked us out of the mud and you washed us off in your grace and you didn't ask us to fix ourselves up and then you plastered us in and then you write your word on our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that when we look at the future, we know you've gone ahead. Give us grace with the I don't knows. Give us grace in the we're not sure, as you promised us. And we will embrace what you've shown us and taught us in your name. Amen. Thank you for joining us. If you're asking yourself, how can I take this further? You can start by going to our website. There, you can access our previous sermons, our banking details, you can get in contact with us, or you can find out more about who we are. If you consider yourself a part of Centre Church, we just want to thank you so much for your continuous support and your partnership. Have an amazing day.